Welcome to Persevere, the podcast that sheds light on the grit and passion of creatives on their journeys. Award-winning destination photographer Ian Ivey is host to these incredible stories to encourage you to pursue your passion. Hello, hello, creatives, and welcome to Persevere. Social media has played a huge part in creative business discovery, not just for consumers, but for the community to find and appreciate each other. I started following today's guest on Instagram, drawn to her chic city style and sustainable minded approach to fashion. In spring of 2021, she introduced her handmade ethical fine jewelry line, Talei Fine Jewelry. It's a pleasure to introduce today's guest, Shermina Ghani. Shermina, I am so happy to have you on the podcast today. How are you? Hey, I'm so excited to be here. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, it's a gorgeous day and I am so happy to be recording with you today on this lovely weekend. Me too. Me too. Good way to spend a Saturday afternoon. (laughs) Exactly. And uh, for our audience who may not know you and your business yet, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your business? For sure. So thank you for the amazing introduction for everyone. I'm Shermina and I run a fine jewelry business called Talei Fine Jewelry. Talei is Farsi for golden. And so it just felt really appropriate. And it's also a family name. So calling it that just felt really good. Um, The line has been officially around for about a year. It'll be one year anniversary on April 30th. And I've got some exciting things planned on social media for that. Um, And it was just kind of born out of a lot of different factors. But I think the main one was during COVID feeling really not creative, just feeling like you were kind of stuck at home doing your regular nine to five. And I've always been more of a creative spirit. And so it started out as kind of a self-taught, self-learning journey that people followed along on social media. And we're really encouraging. And that just kind of turned into an actual legitimate fine jewelry business. And there are so many other factors about it with trying to be sustainable and ethical, which I'm sure you're going to ask questions about. So I'll leave it for that moment. But um, yeah, that that's Talley Fine Jewelry. And it's based out of San Francisco and I hand make everything. Amazing. Yeah. I remember watching your Instagram stories as you were starting the process, learning how to craft your pieces. And it looks like hard work to me because I have no idea the process is involved. How long did it actually take you to teach yourself during, you know, this time to like, while you were getting creative, um, you know, finding new shapes and just also finding materials to do this? Because I don't think not everyone makes a fine jewelry line during the pandemic. So I'm so curious how you went about the process. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that I started off with a little bit of a head start in the sense that when I was in high school and college, I still took like creative related classes. So arts classes, and one of them was a metal smithing class. So I had a little bit of familiarity and a little bit of comfort with like melting metal and fusing metal together, which I would say is a really hard part of getting started. But I never did it with fine jewelry. It was always with like scrap metal, copper, stuff like that, never with silver or gold. And so come early 2020, I got engaged. And part of that process, this can be different for everyone. I don't think there's a right or wrong way. But my partner kept me very, very involved with the ring finding process. I've spent 10 years of my career thinking about sustainability and ethical practices in fashion. And so I brought that mentality into finding the right ring for us. And so I did a lot of research into the metals. I did a lot of research into sourcing the diamonds or sourcing the gems to make sure that what we were investing in was something that was also aligned with my belief system as a consumer. And doing that research taught me a lot about the dirty side and the ugly side of the business. And so that plus the fact that I had some sort of comfort level and it was really exciting to be a creative part of the ring making process when it came to my own personal engagement ring is kind of how I started. So I think you actually were one of the first people that was like excited via Instagram because I shared a couple of diamonds that I had bought that were ethically sourced. And it was just like, 
hey, everyone, this is something that I'm interested in. Let me share it with you. And then I made like the first designs and shared it. And then someone just wanted to straight up buy it. So I started, you know, selling uh, via my own personal account. And then I was like, you know what, I should explore this a little bit more. But it is difficult. I would say that I also still had to do a lot of self-learning. So there was a lot of resources on YouTube. There are a lot of resources on a lot of like jewelry specific websites and even places where you can buy some materials like Rio Grande. And just spending a lot of time watching videos, spending a lot of time reading, spending a lot of time reading books about different practices on fusing metals together, um, setting gems. That's just kind of how I started and how I explored. It's a very expensive habit to get into. I would not recommend it unless you're like very comfortable just seeing money go down the drain. But if it's something that you're interested in, there's so many resources online and you could try to get started on a more like financially conservative basis with not fine metals just to practice. And so I don't think you should be intimidated by it. Yeah, absolutely. I love that how you said that you've incorporated your interests and ethics of the sustainability approach to jewelry as how you have done with fashion. And I just wanted to know, because I think a lot of uh, brides or people in general that are looking for those pieces, their everyday, you know, luxury pieces, sometimes that's not like top of mind when it comes to jewelry. They might just think, oh, well, if it's a, a good quality manufacturer or if it's a name brand, then it must be good. But um, how should do you think, I guess not how should, but for you and your approach to sustainability with fine jewelry, how do you think that that plays an effect just in general with the environment and how consumers um, should maybe take a closer look into things that they're buying for, especially if they're wearing every day? I think that's a great question. I think the jewelry business generally comes at a little bit of an advantage versus, let's say, fashion, just because most of the time, especially with fine jewelry, people buy, aren't buying that en masse. They're investing in pieces. So when it comes to the consumer, they're already like their impact with jewelry versus, let's say, clothing or travel or anything like that is a little bit different. But I would say with jewelry, there are a couple of factors to think about, which is the harm to people and the harm to planet. So starting off with planet, mining for metals and mining for gems is actually really, really destructive to the planet. The chemicals that are used, the amount of environment and the amount of like land that is moved to dig up these gems is really hard on our ecosystem. And so finding gem jewelers that are really aware of the traceability of their gems from the mine all the way through the cutting all the way to it landing on their bench and they're setting the gem is really important and there are a lot of smaller family owned operations in all different kinds of gems so not only diamonds and sapphires but anything that you can think of um, that are way more mindful and when they're done mining in a certain place they revert it back to how it was and they don't use really harsh chemicals within like the process same thing goes for the metals mining for fine metals like gold and silver is also really bad and impactful. So thinking about jewelers who use recycled metals, that means it's already been mined, it's already been used, it's being melted down, and it's being reformed and reshaped. So you're already taking something that's been pulled out of the earth and used and you're reusing it again, just like regular recycling. So that's really great. And then finding jewelers who use Fairmind, and that's a trademark, but Fairmind metals is also another great way to reduce the harm on the planet. Same thing goes with people too. If you've guys seen the like Leonardo DiCaprio movie, Blood Diamond, you're probably really aware of how the diamond industry or the gem industry can take advantage of communities in different countries. And so again, making sure that traceability is there, making sure that people are being paid fair wages, are being given the right equipment to be safe in those environments, are not working crazy hours that's also really important. And again, it comes back to the traceability of the gems. And then at the bench, we also use a lot of chemicals that could be really harmful when you're getting rid of them once you're done. And so there are eco-friendly alternatives to things like flux and things like pickle, which are things that protect the metal and clean the metal after they've hit the flame. And so thinking about that from a jeweler's perspective too is another great way. 
And then from a sustainability aspect of scale, made to order, I always stand by the made to order model. 90% of my business is made to order, which means that nothing is being made unless someone has already bought it, which just lowers the use of materials all around. That's so great to hear made to order. And plus, it feels like a little bit more special because you know it's made particularly for you, the client. Is there any particular gemstones or metals that are less impactful than others? I wouldn't necessarily say so, or at least I personally don't know. Again, like I'm still very early on in my journey, so I'm learning. Um, I don't think there are like metals and gems that are mined from the earth that are less impactful. However, there are some people within the industry who think that lab-grown diamonds and sapphires are less impactful to the planet. It still uses a lot of energy, so there are some trade-offs. Um, and same thing with moissanite. Moissanite is a natural gem. It's not uh, like cubic zirconia or anything like that, but it is also made in labs and it's a great diamond alternative will last you a lifetime is just as strong it's less harsh on the wallet and it's also not mined from the planet because actually it comes from outer space and so that's a really cool thing too who doesn't want a space job right <laughs> so that's exactly <laughs> Awesome. Well, you have mentioned that jewelry shouldn't just be reserved for traditional romantic moments. Um, how do you think jewelry plays a role in feeling empowered in everyday life? Yes, I love that question because I think there's been a lot of marketing and I would say this is more old school. Like I grew up with this marketing, right? Like every kiss begins with K or whatever. Like you, you can't buy yourself a diamond. The diamond is reserved for your significant other to buy it for you. And I think that, yes, that's an absolutely romantic gesture. I loved when I got my engagement ring. Obviously, that was a very important moment in my life. But I do think that jewelry is an amazing investment that you can make in yourself to celebrate milestones, to just like feel good, to recognize moves that you've made in your life, to recognize different accomplishments that you've made. Also a beautiful gift to give to someone that you love. And I think a lot of times people are sometimes scared of the price point of jewelry. And that's something I'm very mindful in my business. I try to make it as accessible as I possibly can. But jewelry, fine jewelry specifically, is made of commodities, right? Gold and diamonds they have like a market value that continues to appreciate over time. So not only are you making an emotional investment in yourself, but that ring or that necklace that you buy for like $1,000 in one year, in the next few years could become $1,500 or $2,000, just depending on the rate of inflation of gold and of diamonds, which in the last six months, if you pay attention or not, like has definitely increased. And so there's also that monetary investment of you, you're holding on to a commodity. And I think that's also a really great way to think about it because again, emotional investment in yourself, but also a really thoughtful investment when you're thinking about your overall wealth. It's a diversification. Yes. Wealth diversification. That is something that I could definitely talk about for a while. <laughs> We're not today on this podcast. <laughs> I think it's so important, especially as women, right? We're not taught to think about investing. We're not taught to think about how to manage our wealth, how to grow our wealth. And a lot of the conversations that do happen around it are very male dominated. Invest in the stock market, like do all these things, whatever. And like, yes, absolutely do that. Like do the things that are necessary. But there are also different ways that you can invest in yourself and your wealth in diverse ways. And I do think that jewelry, if you're really being thoughtful about it, if you're investing in the right pieces, can definitely be part of that journey. Yeah, preach. No. <laughs> that is so true. It's investing in the stock market isn't the only way to invest in your wealth. So uh, kind of changing things up a little bit. I was curious, how has social media really played a part in growing your business? Like I had mentioned, I met you through Instagram in person as well. And that was really great and fun. And <laughs> I don't know if you remember that first time. And I was definitely nervous because I was like, oh, this cool San Francisco fashion 
you know, Instagrammer like wants to shoot with me. And so that was such a fun moment. But I just in general for you and your business, how has that really uh, played a part? Okay, I love that you say you were nervous because I was so nervous. I don't know how it happened, but my social media grew because my partner was taking iPhone photos of my outfits. So like working with a legitimate photographer was very intimidating to me. But just so everyone knows, you're an amazing photographer. You make everyone feel so comfortable. And you also did our engagement photos and made us feel comfortable. So that's amazing. So I love the fact that that's how we met. Um, but to your question around how has social media like helped my business grow? I think that social media helped my business exist, right? Like I, this was something that I was just doing for myself. It was a way for me to get back into creativity. It was a way for me to get back into a challenge. It was also a way for me to take all of this knowledge that I have of my 10 years in the fashion industry learning about sustainability, learning about ethical practices, learning about how to run a business and just figuring things out and doing it my way. And had I not shared that journey and that excitement of like, look, I bought my first gemstones or look, this is my first like ring design that I can personally wear, or I'm trying out these earrings or whatever it may be. Had I not shared those things, had I not been encouraged by the people that I have these amazing relationships with on social media and had people not been like, hey, I want to buy this, Tally would not exist. And so to me, social media is what has built the foundation of Tally. Now, since I started it back in, started sharing about it back in 2020 to where we are today, I think social media, specifically the changes in Instagram and the rise of TikTok has definitely changed a lot. And there's a lot of catching up to do. I wouldn't say that the social media I was super comfortable with and grew as like a sustainable and ethical fashion influencer is the same social media that exists today. And so for me, there's been a huge learning curve around video content around sharing more of myself around speaking to a camera. And so there's a lot of learning that has still had to happen with managing a social media account as a small business owner, and not just as someone who enjoyed sharing what she knew about clothing and ethical and sustainability practices. Yeah, it's definitely been a learning curve for so many people. Not just in the creative industry, but I think overall with the social media landscape constantly evolving, a lot of pivoting having to happen um, and how you had mentioned having to do that learning while managing our business. And I believe both you and I are still working a nine to five as well. So uh, I'm just curious how you manage both running your small business and having a job and having to learn on top of that. There's so many ands I could add to this, but how do you go about managing? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of ands. And um, it is true, like starting a business these days, some people have the capabilities. I personally didn't have the capabilities to like drop my nine to five and fully fund going into running my own small business. And so there is just a lot of balancing. I am not the kind of person that subscribes to hustle culture. Like I value my time. I value my moments of rest. I value being able to spend time with friends and with family. And so for me, it's just really about patience and extreme prioritization. So I'm very strict. My nine to five is my nine to five. I don't do beyond that. And so I'm very efficient with my time there. There's just a lot of like calendar management to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do and delivering what I need to deliver when I need to deliver it with my nine to five. And then outside of that is me just trying to have a really thoughtful schedule around, okay, Monday nights are my nights with my partner, Tuesday night from five to seven, and then we'll eat dinner is when I'll do any sort of accounting related things for my business. Wednesday night is when I create social media content. Thursday night is when I do something else I need to do. I don't even know. And then usually Friday, Saturday, and Sundays are my make and ship days. So that's when I spend the time making the jewelry, um, shipping the jewelry, all of that. And so for now, because I'm still a small business on a small scale, that is manageable. 
who knows what it'll look like one year from now and what the conversation will be. But for me, it's just about being really patient with myself and being really thoughtful about how I prioritize my time to make sure that I'm not burning myself out. Your schedule just seems so much more organized than mine, but <laughs> it's it's definitely true that you have to make time to do all of these things, especially when you have a nine to five, because otherwise there is a very real possibility of you getting burnt out and just maybe even losing that passion because you just don't feel like you can handle everything. So it's so important to kind of break it up like you've done where um, you still have to focus on the back end of your business. So, you know, get the account Counting done, write down your expenses, make sure you have records of everything. And then also making time for the social media, because that also plays a part in uh, growing our businesses as well. So um, I love that you broke it down in that way. So that way, I guess day of your week has like their uh, attention or each the focus for each day of the week, which is great. Yeah, definitely. And I would say like, you're so right. You don't want to burn out from your passion, right? Your passion is supposed to fulfill you. It's supposed to, people always use the cup terminology. It's supposed to like add to your cup, not take away from your cup. So that that's, you're spot on with that. Like you should not be burnt out by your passion. Absolutely. So I was curious now, um, are there any specific challenges you've had to overcome while growing your business and learning along the way. You had said, you know, sourcing sustainability sustainably has been a big part of your business. But and I'm sure that could sometimes come with challenges of finding the right elements. Um, But I'm just curious if there's anything else that has been kind of a hurdle on your journey forward. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think there's a bunch of hurdles, right? First, from a financial perspective, like being able to stand up a business takes a lot of personal investment in a lot of aspects, time, energy, emotion, because like you want to get into it and you want it to blow up and then it doesn't blow up and you have to like level set your expectations. Um, but, but also the financial aspect of it, right? Like whether or not you're balancing it with a nine to five or whether you're leaving your nine to five and doing odd jobs to find, to fund your small business, or if you just cut it off completely, invest all of your time into a small business, right? Like it, it is a financial sacrifice to do it no matter what industry you're in, I would say. And so that's a big hurdle, just like finding the right balance there. Specifically for fine jewelry, I would say, you know, the hurdle of still being able to learn the skill set that I needed to learn. I would have loved to have been able to go to classes and learn firsthand from jewelers that have years of experience. And that was not an option at the time when I was starting it out in like 2020 and early 2021. So there was just a lot of me trying to figure things out and self learn online, getting books, standing up a business too. I thought that I had like a good chunk of transferable skill sets, being a merchant and being able to like run a business and think through all of that. But I still had to tweak my pricing models. I still had to tweak how I was spending versus how much I was owning, um, how I can or cannot pay myself (laughs) in the business. And so those were hurdles. And then I would say within the jewelry industry, right, there's the relationship aspect of it is so important. And so I have been able to create a few relationships via online virtually that have been really amazing and really helpful. But I am also very excited for the day where I get to meet these people in real life at trade shows or like go to boutiques around San Francisco and build stronger relationships with some of the boutique owners for the jewelry. And so there is that aspect of like relationship building challenges that specifically happen for this time period. And then the social media marketing aspect of it too is also a challenge. Like I just cannot keep up with Instagram. And I think I'm getting to a point where I don't know if I want to keep up with it. But that is a learning too, right? You're again, you're not sharing things personally. You're like creating a business. You're creating a voice for that business. You're creating like a cadence of communication. And so the the marketing aspect, I would say, is also a very interesting and exciting challenge, but definitely one of the biggest ones, because that's so important to grow your reach, to grow how many people recognize your brand, how many people know about your brand. And hopefully you continue to do that. 
and grow via word of mouth because that is so important to organic growth of a business. Absolutely. So speaking about all these challenges you've had to overcome, I'm curious what advice you would have for creatives that are starting or wanting to start a jewelry business. What would you say is maybe one of the first things that they should have either a priority on or something that they should work on first while starting their jewelry business? So I would say regardless of your skill set. So if you're coming in as someone who has never touched a torch in their life versus someone who has all of that experience. I think the most important thing to do is spend a lot of time putting pen to paper, thinking of a plan. So think about what it is that you need to get started. How much is that going to cost? How are you going to get access to those materials? Where is a safe place where you can actually make the jewelry that you want to make? You're handling expensive metals and expensive gems. How are you going to protect yourself? How are you going to protect those gems? How are you going to protect your budget? Where do you want to be in three months from now, six months from now? If plan A fails, what does plan B look like? And so I think when you come to the table really thoughtfully with a plan, and honestly, I wish I did more of that in the beginning, because again, like people said, I want to buy this. And I was like, I'm going to start a business. And then I had to do a lot of adjusting as I went. But if you come to the table with a plan, then that like hesitation that you have or that fear that you have is a healthy fear in the sense that it's informed you. And it's not a healthy fear in the sense that it's preventing you from going after something that you're really passionate about. That's I feel like that's so important to hear is having the plan in place before you even get started. Because I think a lot of people and I'm calling out creatives here. <laughs> we just want to go at it and just start creating and doing and and sometimes that the bigger picture isn't the first thing that's in our head. And it's just, we want to go, go, go. (laughs) Definitely. I think, I think with creative, anything within the creative industry, right? You're following your passion, you're pursuing your passion and you want that passion to be how you sustain your life, which is a beautiful goal to have. But at the end of the day, it's business. (laughs) And I think that there is this aspect of get really comfortable with business and the ugly side of it. So you have to like sit there and deal with spreadsheets and Excel. Like I have three Excel tabs open on my computer at all times for the business. Right. And so if you, if for me, one of the things that I found most helpful was there was a book and I'm blanking out on its name. I, I feel like for this podcast, I should have like (laughs) remembered it so I can share it. I'll email you with it afterwards, just in case. But like there was a book that I found that was very specific for the jewelry industry of, and it was literally titled something like how to make money off of making jewelry or something like that. I am sure there is a book in a similar like arena for every single business, how to make money as a photographer, how to make money as a painter, how to do whatever. Read those books because it is coming from someone who's done it. And the book that I read was also so outdated because they were talking about like, old school, like POS systems and things like that, that like, I didn't need to know about, but there is information in there about pricing models, and about the information you need to write purchase orders and create invoices and keep track of them for tax purposes. And so do not forget the nitty gritty, dirty side of the business. Super important to remember. So you got to get dirty with your business sometimes. <laughs> and I won't even share how many tabs I have open. So, <laughs> but um, okay. On a lighter note, I'm curious. So we had shot your engagement photos. I want to say a year ago. Um, and your wedding is actually a month away. And congratulations again. But I was curious, are you designing any other custom pieces? for your special day? Well, I love that question. I think that has been one of the most exciting parts to bring in like the the like passion element of what I do into the wedding. And so I do have some personal pieces that I am creating for myself. So funny enough, I don't have my ears pierced. And so I am creating these really cool gold and pearl ear, ear cuffs for myself. And I, for my bridesmaids, I'm also making them earrings, pearl earrings that are specific to the colors that they're wearing that I'll be gifting them the day of. 
I think they've already seen it, so I'm not ruining a surprise at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm creating pieces for them. I did have a pretty heavy hand in creating Kyle's wedding ring as well, which has been really fun and exciting. And it's very untraditional. So I'm excited to see that uh, at the end of the day. And then for gifts for um, friends and family, I'm also creating some pieces. So it's been a really, it's been really fun to bring both my passion into this really exciting celebratory moment and give something that I made with my hands and my heart to all the people that I love. It's a true labor of love that you are creating, which I, I just love that. I'm so excited to see photos from your big day. I'm so excited. And what dress you're going to wear, of course. But um, it's been so awesome getting to know more about you and your business. Um, I'd love to know more about any upcoming projects you have. Yeah, so honestly, it depends on like how this wedding season is going. But the goal is by summertime, there will be a new collection, which I'm really excited about. And I'm hoping to start graduating into a little bit of like a higher price point gem. So want to play more with diamonds and I want to play more with sapphires. So I'm excited for that because I absolutely love those gems. But then at the same time, from like a business planning perspective, I have these two goals that I'm hoping to hit by the end of the year. We'll see what happens. The first is I would love to show it at a trade show and just get to meet people in real life, um, get to meet more makers and just be in that environment. So I'm really excited to see if I can make that happen. And I would love to get my jewelry carried in two particular stores in San Francisco because I love going to those stores. I'm always shopping at those stores. Half of my own personal jewelry collection comes from them. So I feel like it would be so cool and such an honor to have at least one piece there. I don't even care if it's on like consignment or whatever, but if they just like are carrying telly, that would be so exciting. So those are the goals. Really exciting launch, hopefully happening in the summer and then hopefully getting my pieces out in person and not just existing on social media and online. I love those goals. Those sound so exciting. And I think I know which jewelry store you're talking about. So um, that's super exciting. Um, well, thank you so much, Shermina, for joining us today. Where can our listeners find you and follow for more information? I believe that you had said you have a special offer for our listeners. Yes. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram at Talaye Fine Jewelry. It's T-A-L-A-Y-E-E. I'm sure all of the information will be provided. You can also find me online and shop online at shoptalai.com. And then for all of the listeners here, I would love to offer a 10% discount code. So you can use Persevere10 at checkout and you can get 10% off. Yay! I am so excited for that. I'm going to have to go look myself, but uh, definitely a great code if you want to treat yourself to a special piece for you or a loved one. And yeah, thank you so much, listeners, for tuning in today. Uh, we hope that you found this episode inspiring for your own creative journey. And as always, we are sending good vibes to thrive and hope you are one step closer to pursuing your passions. Bye. Thank you.